52 page. So welcome. We are going to talk about free kick management this evening. This is the same topic we talked about uh, last week with the entry level group. Uh, and I'm going to start doing the same sessions on both the entry level night and the uh, grassroots night. Um, one, so that people, if they can't make one night, can go to the other night, but also on the uh, entry level, we'll make it a little bit more basic, and with the grassroots night, uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail. So if you happen to have joined us a week ago uh, for the entry level webinar on free kick management, we'll go over some of the same stuff, but albeit more quickly. And then we will move on to the, well, the same subject, a little bit more detail, and in particular deal with some more depth in the law, uh, specifically with um, potential repercussions for infractions around direct free kicks, which we did not cover last week. So typical housekeeping items. Um, this will be familiar for those of you who have been on this before. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature. Do not use the Q&A feature. Even though I say this every time we're on a call together, uh, I still have a number of people who submit questions through the Q&A. I will not be checking that. I will not be responding to that. So if you have questions, please use the chat feature only. It is easier for me to keep track of what everybody needs and is doing uh, and what comments folks are making. So kindly respect that and use the chat feature. Also, just a reminder, due to the number of people on the call, we will not open up uh, the ability for people to speak. It just gets a little bit too much uh, to manage. So nobody's microphones will work. So any communication you need, please use the chat feature. So moving us along, to talk about free kick management, always it's first to talk about what kind of free kick are we worried about. So wrong one there, pardon me. So we're going to talk first about the laws of the game and the types of free kicks that we need to worry about. One, obviously, is the indirect, indirect free kick, the other being the direct free kick. So just for a very quick refresher on the different kinds of uh, free kicks that we have. Let me close a couple of windows here so I don't share my screen too much there. Um, so talking about direct free kicks first, these are just very quickly the kinds of direct free kick fouls we have. This is directly from the laws of the game. We have charging, jumping at, kicking or attempt to kick, pushing, striking, tackles or challenges, trips or attempting to trip. Those are the seven that we're used to referring to. These are obviously uh, careless, reckless, excessive force has to do with whether or not there's any misconduct. And then some additional ones for us to think about, handball offenses, holding, impeding an opponent with contact. I want to underline that emphasis there, with contact. We see a lot of people calling indirect free kicks for impeding when in fact contact has happened. So if there's ever an impeding situation, which quite honestly is rare, um, and you have contact between the two players, it needs to be a direct free kick, not an indirect free kick. And then, of course, biting or spitting. Hopefully, we don't see that too often. And then throwing an object at the ball, at an opponent, or at a match official uh, is also a direct free kick. So those are our direct free kick fouls. Uh, the free kicks that we're going to focus on tonight are primarily going to be in direct free kick scenarios, in particular in and around the penalty area, because that's when we have the most incidents that require us to manage and be worried about how we're facilitating a direct free kick. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what my screen is showing right now, this is the IFAB website. The laws of the game are on the IFAB website. And so if you just search IFAB, you'll end up with this screen and you can go to laws of the game. And here you have an introduction, various notes, the modifications that were made. If you're interested in reading up on the VAR protocol, it is here. And of course, the laws. And then there's a lot of supporting documentation and practical guidelines for things. A lot of background on why they made some of the law changes. But if you click laws 1 to 17, you end up with this great interface here that goes through the 17 laws. And then you can choose on the one that you want to explore more. So for here, fouls and misconduct, we have the introduction, direct free kick offenses, indirect free kick offenses, playing in a dangerous manner, impeding the progress of the opponent without any contact being made, so an emphasis there. 
um, descent, things of that nature. If you need to stop the game for descent, we're going to have an indirect free kick when you restart, preventing the goalkeeper. And of course, any other offense not mentioned in the laws of the game for which you are stopping play to caution or send off a player. And then there's a number of indirect free kick fouls that are related to the goalkeeper. We're not going to cover those in detail this evening because it's not as germane to our discussion. So moving back now to free kicks, those we've talked about the kinds of fouls that lead to our free kicks, and we know that we have an indirect free kick or a direct free kick. Now what I'm going to go through a little bit more quickly this evening is the same stuff we went through last time. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here, and we're going to talk about the steps we want to use when managing a free kick. A lot of this might seem basic or rudimentary. However, when we're out watching referees, um, we're seeing a lot of deficiency in this area. So we thought it'd be helpful um, to just go through the kind of steps and the practices that we want you using when you're managing a free kick. So first step is move to the, immediately to the spot of the foul upon calling a free kick. So you see there's a foul, you blow the whistle, we want you to move to the spot of the foul pretty much immediately, and depending on the severity of the foul, quickly. Uh, there's a couple reasons we want you to do that. One, obviously, if the player has been fouled, there's a chance they may be hurt, and so we want you to go and check on that player, make sure they are okay. To do that, obviously, you need to be at the spot of the foul. Sometimes the player who committed the foul may require a little bit of management. Maybe the foul doesn't quite escalate to wanting a caution for uh, a reckless challenge or a send-off for endangering the safety, but you still need to talk to that player so that you can modify the behavior. Obviously, you need to go to the spot of the foul to make that happen for a couple of reasons. One, the guilty party will likely be there by the time you get there. And secondly, it's important when you go to manage a player that everybody else be aware of it. When a foul happens, they're more than likely going to have their, their the spectators involved, the coaches, the other players, et cetera, will likely have their attention focused on the spot in and around the foul. And so any management that you're going to do of a player guilty of an offense needs to happen somewhat close to the spot of the foul so that people can see that you're addressing the behavior. If you let the player go away and you go find them somewhere else on the field, the impact of that management is going to be less than if you talk to them in close proximity to the spot of the foul. Now, obviously, if there is a lot of tension on the field or if there's a mass confrontation or if there's a lot of anger about the foul, maybe we don't keep the guilty party right there in the middle of all that to manage them. But by and large, 75% of the fouls you're going to deal with, you want to talk to the player close to the spot of the foul. We need you to get there to be able to do that. Obviously, any misconduct is also going to be more effective if you're at the spot of the foul when you show it. So moving quickly to the spot allows you to show that misconduct. And then the last thing we see, and we see this pretty often, particularly the older the players get, is you may have emotions being manifested in and around that free kick. So if uh, a particularly bad foul happens or if there's a frustrating foul or if the game itself has just seen the temperature rising and you have a foul, you might have some players expressing some emotion, either physically or verbally, around the spot of the foul, and you need to be there to manage that. So for a number of reasons, when you call a foul, particularly in and around the penalty area, we want you moving quickly and immediately to the spot of the foul. Any questions on that? Any guidance you've been given that conflicts with that that's worthy of discussion? Okay, then once you've moved to the spot of the foul, we want you to set the location of the ball for the free kick. Now, we want you to wait until everybody is settled before you do that. So what I mean is if you've got a player to manage, if you have a yellow card to issue, if people are frustrated and you have to settle emotions in and around that free kick, we want you to do all of that before you then worry about the location of the ball. So make sure everybody's calmed down, you know, players have separated, everybody's focused on the next phase of play before you worry about the spot of the free kick. The last thing we want you do or want you doing is having 
you know, players pushing and shoving or, you know, confronting each other or yelling at each other about something. And you're looking down, focused on where the ball is going to be set for the free kick. So make sure everybody involved in this play is a little bit settled before you move on to the location of the ball. I'm going to pause for a moment here and answer a couple of questions. It took a moment to type. Apologize for moving on too quickly. So question, what if the player moves away from the foul? That's okay. That happens sometimes. Um, if they move away from the foul very, very quickly and you need to talk to them, obviously call them back into some sort of neutral area. Don't demand they come back to you. Don't go all the way to them. Meet them somewhere in a neutral spot. But if we are moving quickly to the spot of the foul, particularly remember that we're thinking about fouls in and around the penalty area where we're actually going to have to manage the free kick. Often the times players aren't going to disappear. There's nowhere for them to go because the foul is so close to their own goal. So they're likely going to be in that immediate area. Uh, question here, we comment on allowing potential quick restarts. Absolutely. If assuming you're five, eight, 10 yards away from play in and around the penalty area, maybe 15 yards, depending on how quickly that play developed, and you call a free kick, in the time that it takes you to move to the spot of the foul, you're already going to know if they're going to play quick or not. Because in particular, again, thinking about free kicks in and around the penalty area, if they're going to play quick, it's going to be almost immediate. They're going to get up, put it down, and play. You're not even really going to have time to get there, let alone interfere with that quick restart. So as you're moving to the spot of the foul, keep your eyes open to see if the body language of the player suggests they want to play quick. And if you get that vibe that maybe they want to play quick, stand back for just a second and give them the space to do that. If they don't successfully play quick within a second or two, then you want to insert yourself because they're probably not going to play quick. The important thing to note is if you are inserting yourself, meaning you've gotten close to the spot of the foul and you're engaging defending players, particularly to start to move them back or to, to separate players who are frustrated with each other, whatever that is, once you insert yourself into the situation, you can't allow a quick restart to happen. It's unfair to the defense that you've inserted yourself, distracted players to keep them from going at each other if that's what's happening, and then you allow a quick free kick. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, so once you engage in the play, opportunity for a free kick is dead. You're going to bring it back, blow the whistle, and stop it if they try to replay quickly. Question here, moving to the spot of the foul, is it more important if it's near the penalty area or does it matter? Uh, it's even more important the closer to the penalty area that you get. Um, there's going to be big moments, particularly as it gets in and around the penalty area, and you want to show a lot of confidence there. You want to be very convincing in your decision, which means moving quickly to the spot of the foul. So I would say the closer and tighter it gets to the penalty area, the more quickly you want to move to the spot of the foul because those are big moments in the game. The question here, I don't think the ref has to set the location of the ball. What about a quick free kick? So we'll talk about setting the location of the ball. We do want the referees to oversee the setting of the location. We don't want you to actually physically put the ball down yourself, but you as the referee need to dictate exactly where that ball is going to be placed. So we'll get to that in just a second. One more question, once you insert yourself, say on the whistle, that's actually getting a little bit ahead of it. Uh, and so if you'll, you'll disregard that comment to all the pal uh, panelists about once you insert yourself, say on the whistle, that's not exactly correct. Because what we're talking about when we say inserting yourself is actually much earlier than that. Once you get in really close proximity to the spot of the free kick, you are going to be a distraction to the players. So once you're three, four yards away from the spot of the free kick, particularly in and around the penalty area, if you've gotten that close, it's because they've decided to play quickly, or excuse me, they decided not to play quickly, and you have something you need to manage there. So there's a few steps you're going to go through before you say, wait for the whistle. The scenarios we want you to be sensitive to are if players are defending players are jumping up to try to kick the ball away, if players are pushing, pushing and shoving a little bit, if you're getting that kind of activity and you insert yourself into that, you're not going to have a chance to say on the whistle or wait for the whistle because you're still going to be sorting out whatever the challenges are in that moment. So basically the thing to be aware of is once you insert yourself into a situation, you can't allow a quick free kick to happen. 
So once everybody has settled down, you've talked to the player that needed player management, you've shown the yellow card, uh, any players who are pushing and shoving or expressing dissent at the referee, all those things have been taken care of. Now we can focus on the location of the ball. And so what we want you to do is wait until everybody is settled and then spot the ball. Now, obviously, I don't want you to take the ball from the player and put it on the ground for them. That's your job. That's their, or excuse me, that's their job. That's their role. You don't need to actively do that for them. But what you do need to do is stand directly next to the spot that you want the ball to be placed and indicate towards the ground that that's where the ball is. It's important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, players will automatically try to improve their position. It may be moving the ball forward a little bit. If the ball is to the outside of the penalty area, they may want to move that ball two or three yards towards the inside of the field because that creates a better angle for their free kick. So you want to go and spot the exact spot of the foul for them in situations where there's going to be a potential advantage for where the ball is. And that's pretty much anywhere and around the penalty area. So stand over the spot of where you want the ball and indicate with a hand down to the ground that this is exactly where you want the ball. And then the closest AR to the free kick, it might be the person who's right next to it, or it might be the trailing AR if it's over towards the coffin corner of the field. Whoever the closest AR is, we want you to keep an eye on the ball location because the referee is going to be asked for the ball to put down. And once the player puts it down, the referee is going to have other stuff to worry about. And so we want one of our teammates, more than likely the trailing person, to keep an eye on what that ball is doing so that a player doesn't pick it up and move it once the, the referee has moved on to the next phase of this. So ARs, keeping a close eye on where the referee is indicated and make sure the players aren't moving the ball. So wait till everybody's settled, spot the ball, AR, pay attention to it couple of questions here. Do you have to wait to be asked to step off the 10 yards? The answer to that is no, but we'll get to that here in just a second. Anytime you have a free kick in and around the penalty area, unless they get up and play it right away, you're going to have what's called a ceremonial free kick. Now, 99 times out of 100, free kicks in and around the penalty area are going to be ceremonial free kicks. Unless they get up and play it right away, Assume it's going to be a ceremonial free kick and insert yourself. So by a ceremonial free kick, what we mean by that, the definition of it is one where the attacking team is going to need to wait for the whistle. The referee is going to set the wall at 10 yards, get back into position and blow the whistle. Stuff we're going to go through this evening. So just pretty much assume unless a player jumps right back up and does a quick free kick in and around the penalty area that this is going to be a ceremonial free kick. So once you've set the ball, now we talk about moving the wall back. So obviously wait until the ball is on the ground and set, meaning you've confirmed with the attacking player this is where it's going to be. They have put the ball down and have started to back away from it. Once you get that, now it's time to worry about the wall. Now there's stuff you can be doing proactively while things are getting sorted out. And, you know, the player's setting the ball down. You can tell players, hey, have a step back for a moment. I'm going to march off 10 yards. You can tell them that sort of proactively so they can start to back up. But the big thing is wait until you've spotted the ball on the ground. The attacking player has backed up a little bit, indicating they're not going to touch the ball anymore. And then show the whistle and ask for them to wait for the whistle. It's at this point, once the ball has been set and clearly isn't going to move anymore, that we want you to show the whistle, point to it, and say, please wait for the whistle. This is something you want to say to the attacking player. But you need to do it in a way that everybody else around you is able to see that you've pointed at the whistle. Because you're going to have a goalkeeper who's in the goal area wanting to set the wall, who's going to need to see that indication from you that you're going to wait for the whistle. And so in those scenarios, take a step, point to the whistle so that it's public for everybody, and say, please wait for the whistle. Get confirmation from the attacker. Make eye contact with the attacker when you do that so that you know they've heard you and they're going to wait. And then we actually want you to pace off 10 yards. So this is the reason why on the last slide I suggested that the assistant referees need to pay close attention to 
the, the location of the ball. There's always a lot of discussion in the referee community about um, priorities of, your, of the referee's focus while you're setting a wall. A number of people, there used to be a school of thought that you needed to backpedal while counting off the 10 yards to keep your eye on the ball. The school of thought has evolved a little bit now because if you are backpedaling to show or to keep your eye on the ball, your back is going to be to the penalty area and who knows what kind of pushing, shoving, elbowing, punching, kicking, who knows what might be going on in the penalty area and you as the referee are not watching it. So when we have to prioritize what's more important, the location of the ball for the free kick or potential violent conduct in the penalty area behind the referee's back, we're obviously going to be more worried about what's happening behind the referee's back. So the current guidance for you now is set the ball where you want it, leave the ball to your back, trusting that one of your ARs will be paying attention and making sure that player doesn't pick it up and move it. Also, you know, pay attention to where you place the spot of the ball so that you can turn around once you've set the wall and make sure it's still there. Use whatever markings are on the field to help you with that. But we want you to leave your back at the ball and march off those 10 yards. Now we want you to pace them off so that nobody can really argue with you about the, the selection of 10 yards. We find most referees who um, just try to eyeball the 10 yards usually only giving, end up giving about seven to eight yards. They're not giving the full 10. That leads to frustration from the attacker and it gains an advantage for the defender. So what we want you to do is go practice somewhere what it feels like to march off 10 yards, how big do your steps need to be, et cetera, so that you can march off a full 10 yards and then set the wall. But please do not eyeball it and do not leave your back to everything behind you so that you can keep your eye on the ball because what's happening behind you in the penalty area is going to be much more important. And we'll see some video examples of that here in a couple of minutes. Once you get 10 yards away, please ask the defensive players to join you where you are. Don't yell at them, get back, don't come here, don't say anything like that. Get to the 10 yards and say, folks, please join me here. Ladies, please join me here. Gentlemen, please join me here. Guys, get back here, please. Ask them to come to where you are at the 10 yards. If you've done it well, they'll be backing up with you as you go, but get to the spot you want the wall, set them there, and then ask them to join you. Any questions there? I've got a few here, so I'm going to read them. Is the correct way to show the whistle in front of you or above the head? We've moved away from the above the head uh, as much as, as we used to, but either way, the thing that's important is that the goalkeeper and the attacker know that you've asked for them to wait for the whistle. So I'm not going to worry too much about where it is as long as everybody knows. Question here, what is the communication mechanism by the AR without radios to indicate the kicker relocated the ball after setting it? It seems that this happens even though you talk to the kicker. Absolutely, sometimes this happens. So I would hope that the referee would be able to manage this themselves without involvement from the AR. Referees, don't absolve yourself of any responsibility here. You look at where you put the ball on the ground, pay attention to the markings around where the ball is, and then once you've paced off the 10 yards, keep your eye on whether or not that ball has moved. It's really easy to notice what panel on the ball is, is looking at you when you, when you move away. Uh, where is the ball in relation to the D? Is there, you know, uh, if you're on a football field, what mark are you on? If, if you're on a grass field, are there any, you know, go for holes nearby, you know, whatever markings you have on the field, pay attention to where you put the ball so that you can actually notice if they do move it. If the AR is required, we would want a flag to go up to indicate, hey, he moved the ball. You're probably going to need to shout to get their attention to let them know, but it's important that we do that so the players don't think they can get away with it. Another question, can you comment on what you see as appropriate positioning of the ball further away from the goal with no reason to intervene? Is it okay, i.e., is it okay to restart if within three to four yards of the spot of the foul? 
I would also appreciate your comments on players' desire to push the ball forward. So generally speaking, if we're not in a ceremonial free kick, if, you know, if we're out in the middle of the field somewhere, uh, we're going to be a little bit less worried about the exact spot of the foul and just more interested in the ball getting put into play quickly. So I would ask you to think about a couple of things. If they're just looking to put the ball down quick and play it, meaning they're just going to put it down and knock it square or knock it back to somebody, who cares? Let them put, them, put the ball back in play and move on with it. If it's a team that has a tactical advantage by knocking long balls into the penalty area for some big tall guy who's going to run up there and head it, then we want to be a little bit more specific about where it is. Because if they move it up three or four yards closer to the goal and that allows them to now put the ball into the penalty area, we need to be worried about that. So I think by and large, let's pay attention tactically what's happening. And as long as they're not trying to gain a significant advantage from it, meaning the more likely scenario, which is they just put it down real quick and play it square to put the ball back in play. No problem. We move on with it. Question here. Do you suggest physically walking off the 10 yards for every free kick when it's asked for, even in the defensive third or just ones close to the penalty area? Just the ones close to the penalty area. If you're in the defensive third, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have somebody even trying to get, you know, or trying to be closer than 10 yards. And if you do, just, you know, raise your voice and ask him to back up a little bit. So we don't need to go all over the field and march off 10 yards. I'm mostly referencing here to free kicks in and around the penalty area where we have ceremonial free kicks. Middle third of the field, defensive third, we're not going to have ceremonial free kicks. So we don't need to worry about that as much. Question here, what about the use of a foam mark? Uh, disappearing spray is not approved to use in the youth game, so we should not be using it in the youth game. Last thing we want to do after we've moved the wall back is manage any attackers that are in the wall. And we're going to reference a law change now that came about uh, over the summer. Hopefully everybody is familiar with it at this point, but just in case you're not, here is the law change. Oops, my computer is freezing for a second, pardon me. All right, so when there is a defensive wall of at least three players, all attacking team players must be at least one meter from that wall. Now, one meter away can mean one meter behind it, one meter in front of it, one meter to the sides of it. It doesn't matter in what direction they are one meter away. It just means they have to be one meter away from it. So there's a reason why we have this, and some of you might be familiar with this referee and or this game. This was from the 2018 World Cup. Here we have the referee following a lot of the instructions we're talking about tonight, setting the wall. But because we hadn't had the law change yet, all the attackers and defenders are all in together, and watch what happens over here. This is the kind of stuff that happens when attackers and defenders are allowed to be in the wall together. And look where the referee was at the time that this happens. He's dealing with something over here, again with the attackers in the wall, and completely misses a potential red card for a headbutt here. So because this has been a persistent problem in the game for years now, uh, and because we just don't want things like this happening, FIFA decided to change this law. Another good example. The white player is an attacker here who's wanting to take up a certain position right down in here. Defender really doesn't want him to, and that's what we end up with as a result. So again, a lot of conflict happens in and around the wall when attackers are trying to get in it. FIFA finally said, you know what, we don't want to have that anymore. And so they created a new law. So this is what it used to look like with the law change. Now this player is not allowed to stand here anymore. Instead, we want to see this. Defensive wall is here. Player can be in the wall, but has to be one yard, or excuse me, one meter away from it. So this is the kind of scenario we want to see moving forward with this. Any questions on that? We had a question here. A defensive player tries to prevent the quick kick on the attacking half. Talk to the players how many times. This is a completely different topic, so we're not going to tackle that. Uh, delaying the restart is definitely a big topic, but I could spend an entire hour talking just about delaying the restart, so I'm not going to comment on 
how strict you should be. What I will say is this is an area of the game where we can show some discretion. We can manage our way out of some of these scenarios. We don't have to give a yellow card unless it's very painfully obvious. The player goes to kick the ball and somebody kicks the ball away from or jumps in front of it to block it on purpose to delay that kind of a restart. But if it's just a general, I'm going to stand there and be in the way, you've got some flexibility to manage there. Question here, the number of attackers in the wall is important, correct? Actually, no, it's the number of defenders. So again, if you go back to the law change, you'll note that it says when there is a defensive wall of at least three players. So if there are only two defenders in the wall, then this law is irrelevant. Anybody can stand anywhere they want if there's only two players. More than likely, the kind of free kicks we're talking about tonight in and around the penalty area, you're going to have three players in that wall, which means everybody else has to be a meter away. But if you have a wall with two people or one person in it, then attackers can stand wherever they want. It's only when we have three players or more in the wall. Question here, do we caution a player who deliberately moved the ball after it has been spotted and you've moved away? No, that's not anything worthy of a caution. Just ask him to put the ball back where you had it. So moving on now, to the position for the restart. We want you to wait until all the players are in the correct position. So again, uh, you've set the ball, they have not moved it, you've gone, you've set the wall, everybody in the wall is where they're supposed to be, everything the, looks the way it's supposed to look, the next thing we want you to do is move to a position for the restart. Now what we want you to do is move to the position needed to see the next phase of play. So this is where reading the game and a little bit of football understanding comes into play. So if you've got a free kick somewhere in the middle of the penalty area, it's highly likely that the next thing is going to be a shot on goal. They're probably going to take that free kick and have it be a shot on goal. If the uh, free kick is off to the sides of the penalty area and the players look like they're setting up for a cross, then we want you to be over closer to the drop zone. So the reason we want you to think about these things is because of the likelihood of the next decision you have to make. If the next thing that's going to happen on the free kick is a shot on goal, it's likely there's going to be a number of players in the wall. And the next likely decision you're going to have to make is probably going to be a potential handball in the wall if the shot is blocked by the wall. That's one of the biggest moments in the game we have, that somebody takes a free kick, they kick it directly into the wall, and there's a shout for handball. For you to be able to see that and make that decision accurately, you need to be looking at the front of the wall. So if there's a free kick that is obviously going to be a shot on goal, we want you to take up a position behind the ball or off to the side of the ball, not in the way of any of the attacking players, but in a position where you can clearly see all players in the front of the wall so that if the ball is blocked in the wall, you can definitively say that it wasn't blocked by a hand. If they are setting up for what looks to be a cross, then we want you to go and stand closer to the drop zone so that you can be close to where the ball lands when the free kick is taken. Question here, if a player preparing to take the free kick alters the turf, after sanctioning him with a yellow card, should you move the ball or allow it to remain where it was when the turf was altered? Uh, I think you have to be careful about this. It's not often that an attacking player is going to alter the turf in a way that you're going to need to give a yellow card. I think the, the law that was written about altering the ground uh, around the spot of a free kick is actually more pointed towards defenders who try to damage the area of where the ball is going to be as a, a way to get a little bit more advantage over the attacking player. So I can't imagine a scenario where an attacking player alters the ground around the, the, the free kick in a way that's going to make you give a yellow card. If anything, I could see them uh, trying to show or trying to move, you know, the corner flag or something like that. You're just going to ask them to, to put it back. So I can't imagine a scenario where you're going to sanction an attacker with a yellow card. So, again, if a shot is anticipated, we want you looking into the wall. If a cross is anticipated, we want you near the drop zone. So here is an example. Everything about this free kick from where it is and from where the players are lined up 
would suggest that this player is likely to cross the ball. And if he's going to cross the ball, it's probably going to be around into this area somewhere. So now we'll watch this clip and we'll explain why we want you to take a different position than this referee has taken in this game. So as you can see, at the taking of the free kick, if we're gonna assume that this can be the drop zone, the referee is a good 25 yards away or so from that drop zone. And more importantly, it's very unlikely that there's gonna be a handball decision in the wall here. So the referee doesn't need to be this far over to the right. Instead, we want the referee over in this area, closer to all the players where the ball is likely to drop. So after the taking of the free kick, you can see the next decision he has to make is right around in here. And for both the ability to see it and the ability to be credible once you've made a decision, ideally you're standing over here. And that was very easy to predict by looking at the way the players are setting up that this is where we want you to stand. So if you're standing here at the taking of this free kick, where the mouse is now, you're gonna be in a very credible position should you need to make a decision there. Question here, do we caution a defensive player that moves the ball after it has been spotted and you move on to the next flat play? You have that option, but again, this is when a, an area where you have some discretion. It's going to be highly unlikely if you do your job right, meaning you clear everybody out of the area where you want the ball to be spotted and then you put the ball on the ground, it's highly unlikely a defender is going to come back into that space once you've made it clear this is a ceremonial free kick, spot the ball right here, and it's just the attacker there. If they do, it's going to likely be very confrontational, and you probably will need a yellow card, but you need to judge that based on the reactions of everybody in the game. If there's pushing and shoving as a result of a player doing that, then sure. But I think it's highly unusual that you're going to have that happen. So question here, sorry if you're getting ahead, but what if the free kick is on the opposite side of the AR and the drop zone would be right in front of the AR? Would you take the spot? As, where would you take the spot? So I think it's important, and I'll go back to the, the thing here. In that scenario, you're talking about the free kick would be over here to the left off of the screen. The drop zone is not going to be over here in front of the AR. The drop zone is still going to be in the center of the goal. So this, if you have an attacking free kick in and around the penalty area where there's going to be a cross, the very, very likely scenario is going to be that the ball is going to land somewhere in the goal mouth because that's where the goal is and that's where they want the ball to be kicked into the goal. So to think that there would be a drop zone over here in front of the AR when in and the free kick's coming from over on the left is, is probably not realistic. The drop zone is always going to be somewhere around here in the mouth of the goal which means somewhere around this area is where we want you to be looking because it means you can see through the players and you have the assistant referee in your peripheral vision. So no matter if it's coming from this side or over on the left side, this area right here is more than likely where we're going to want you. So you've done all of this other work. Now we want you to blow the whistle. Once you've taken a spot that you can clearly see what the next phase of play is, the next thing we want you to do is blow the whistle to restart play. So standing more towards the AR rather than down by the six. Joel, I'm sorry, I'm really confused by your question. I don't understand why anybody would be down by the six for a free kick coming from the other side. If you have a foul, listen closely what I'm saying because I've already answered your question. If you have a foul in and around the penalty area where a cross is very likely going to happen, we want you to be right here. Because no matter what side it comes from, the ball is very likely to land in this area of the field, in the goal mouth somewhere. You want to be standing right around here to see it. You don't want to be standing over here because that's going to get you in the way of play and you're not going to be able to see anything. And then when there's a counterattack, you're going to be really, really far behind play. This is where we want you to be on crosses into the penalty area from a set piece. All right, so now a positive example. 
So in this play, we've had a referee who has called a foul and has moved to the spot of the foul. She is already catching this clip after she has already dealt with whatever protests she had, whatever interaction she had with players have already happened. And now you can see the players have started to back up on their own. This is something that I love about the women's game. They just back up and go where they're supposed to because they're not adolescent ch children like the men's players can be sometimes. Men always have to stand there and be told what to do. Women just understand and they go and they stand there. I really wish we could have that in the men's game as well. But as you can see, the referee has stood over the spot where she wants the ball. And as I play this video, we'll talk through what the referee is doing. All right, I'll just play it through once and let you watch it. And then we'll talk about everything that this referee has done on this. So, let's start here. Referee standing over the spot of the ball, indicating on the ground where she wants the ball to be put. Once the player puts it there, she makes eye contact and says, wait for the whistle, and leave, leave the ball where it is. Then she marches off for 10 yards. The players are already pretty close to that spot as it is, but she marches it off anyway. And here you see her telling the players, come back to where I am. So you see the players in yellow here have had to take a couple of steps back. And the attacking players are starting to come with her. And she puts her hand out to say, don't move back any further. So this is the referee getting that one yard of space between the defensive wall and where the attackers are. She gets everybody where she wants them. And now she stands in front of the players to make sure they're going to stay where they are. So at this moment, there's a step that this referee has to take that you as grassroots referees don't have to take, which is putting the spray down. She has to do that. This is the World Cup. She doesn't have a choice but to do that. But what she does do is she makes sure that the wall is set and that the players who are going to be in the wall are there. Because as you see, they're moving things around a little bit. She's patient and she waits until all the players who are going to be in the wall are there. And then she gives them the instructions. Now, the next thing that she does is something you can add into your game. She gets their attention. She gets eye contact. They're all looking at her. Once she does that, she indicates by pointing up to be careful with your hands. Now, this is a free kick that is inside the penalty area, which means if somebody handles the ball when trying to block the shot, we're going to have to call a PK. And so for a little bit of management purposes and some proactive refereeing, she is saying, Watch your hands above your head, because if you handle the ball, it's going to be a penalty kick. Now, she does that, one, to try to help these defenders and just remind them it's a nice courtesy to give them. But also, if she has to call a penalty kick on the next play, when the coach gets really upset with her, she can say, hey, I warned your players not to put their hands up. And she does it visually with a gesture so that everybody in the stadium knows that she's saying, watch your hands above your head. You'll see in, a, in the United States, you'll see referees put their arm up over their head and tap on their arm to suggest watch your hand. Any gesture you want to use that clearly indicates to everybody involved, the spectators, the coaches, the other players on the field, that you are warning those people about using their hands is going to help you if you end up having to call a penalty kick. Once she gets that, she's good. Then she moves on to the next phase, which is she talks to the players in the attacking wall and tells them, don't move back. You have to be where you are. This is a good step if you're doing grassroots or adult games where the players are savvy enough to actually put an attacking wall in front of the defending wall. Go to them and say, don't encroach. 
because if they get too close to the wall, you're going to call an indirect free kick going out. She gives them a warning. Once she's got confirmation, then she goes and she gets in a position to be able to see. Now in this scenario, one of two things could happen. Very, very likely this is going to be a shot. So she takes a position where she can see the wall, but there might be a chance at 2v2 over here that this player just decides to chip the ball too. And so she takes a position where she can see both things if it happens. So if there's a shot, she can see the wall. If there's some sort of set piece or trick play where they chip it over here, she's in a position to see that as well. And then right as the free kick is taken, she realizes she doesn't have as good a view of the wall as she wants because of the attackers, and she adjusts her position so that she can now see the wall more clearly. This is an ideal position for her to be able to see both the wall and anything off the ball that may happen. And as anticipated, we have a shot on goal, which she can see clearly. So really excellent job from this referee in managing this set piece. Any questions on that process at this point? So the question here, if you call encroaching on the defensive wall, is the spot of the indirect free kick where the wall was or the spot of the original kick? So I wanna make sure we're using the right language here. If we call encroaching on the defense, we're going to retake the kick. If the defensive wall has encroached, we blow the whistle, we retake the kick. If it's the attacking players who encroach into the defensive wall, the attacking players are the ones who are guilty of encroachment. When you call the free kick, it's at the spot where the encroachment happens. So at whatever point the attacker was when the free kick was taken, then you want to use the spot of where that infraction actually happened. Any other questions on that process? I want to leave a couple of minutes at the end here to talk about uh, some of the things that we want to do when we do have things uh, that are inappropriate take place. Any other questions on that entire process that we've worked through now in the last 50 minutes? As a center ref, are we relying on the AR to watch offside or on getting, yeah, offside on kicks? That is correct, yes. It is always the AR's responsibility to watch for offside at any point throughout the game, not just on attacking free kicks. There used to be years and years ago uh, guidance that the, the referee would go and take the line and the AR would go down to the goal line. What we found when we really thought about it is the, the number of times that you needed the AR to be right on the goal line for potential in and out was so rare and we were sacrificing the referee having their eyes on other more likely scenarios uh, that we, we changed that. So we don't ever send the, refer the assistant referee, excuse me, down to the goal line and have the referee take up the offside position. We haven't done that in probably a decade or so, if not more. So ARs always have the offside line and we have them sprint down to the goal line because it's highly rare that we have a goal line decision on a free kick. And it's much more common that we have handball on the wall or pushing off the ball or all those things where we need the referee's eyes. All right. so. Question here, if attackers encroach in the defensive wall, at what point do you call it? It's basically right as the kick is taken. You can't have it happen beforehand. So if it starts to happen before the free kick is taken, we want you to not allow the free kick to be taken and deal with it at that point. Question here, I've been told that for an indirect free kick, the center referee doesn't have to hold an arm up until a second player touch occurs. Is that new? That's not technically correct. Per the laws of the game, you are supposed to hold that hand up until it touches a second player. Um, in practical terms, if you've called offside on one end of the field uh, and they're just going to kick the ball up towards midfield, do you need to touch or keep your arm up until the ball gets headed at midfield? Probably not. You can probably put it down while the ball's in flight. If it's obvious, it's not going to go in the goal. The reason that we keep our hand up is because if there are indirect free kicks in around the penalty area, we want a reminder to everybody that it has to touch a second player before it goes in the goal. If you're outside of that scenario, have the hand up when the ball gets played. And as soon as it's obvious it's going to be played by somebody else pretty, pretty quickly, you can go ahead and put it down. 
technically the laws of the game say you're supposed to keep it up, but in a practical matter, running when you're, when your arm is raised up in the air, isn't always easy. So just go ahead and put your hand down once it's clear that it's about to be touched by somebody else. All right. I want to take just a moment and go back into um, some of the IFAB laws and just talk a little bit about a couple other procedural things. We have just a few more minutes here. So free kicks we know at the spot of the foul, et cetera. This is all stuff that we know and is pretty easy. The ball must be stationary and the kicker must not touch the ball again until it's touched another player. If that happens, if we have a double touch, then we have an indirect free kick going the other direction. The most common scenario we see this is actually on penalty kicks when the ball hits the, the post and comes back without having touched anybody else and the player takes a second shot, we got to remember that the post doesn't count. It has to be another player. So if someone takes a penalty kick, it hits the crossbar or the post and comes back to them without touching anybody else and they kick it again, indirect free kick going out. The ball is in play when it is kicked and clearly moves. So if a player touches the ball and, and it clearly moves with their foot or with their knee or whatever, if they do some weird trick play and they fall down and hit it with their hip, all that is fine. It just has to clearly move. A player, this is a, a, an interesting thing to read that they, they clarified in this law, a free kick can be taken by lifting the ball with a foot or with both feet simultaneously. So if someone just wants to lift the ball up with their foot to another player, they can do that. Question here, what happens if the ball is touched by the non-kicking foot and then the kicking foot? If it's at the same time, as you can see here, this is simultaneous, then it's okay. If you kick it from one foot into the other, then it's technically a double touch and we have to go out. Question here on a center circle restart after a goal, does the offense get a second try if double touched? Nope. If they kick it once and they kick it again, it's an indirect free kick going the other way. In the youth adult games, the defense will engage the referee in verbal challenge of the call foul then the attacker takes a, quit, a free kick. The defense then argues they were questioning the original foul. How can you handle this? So that's what I was talking earlier about intervention. If you have inserted yourself into a situation, meaning you're close to the spot of the free kick and you're talking with a defender, then yes, you can't allow a free kick. So really it's important to read the body language of the attacking players as you're calling the foul. If they're jumping up to play quick again, then just stay away and let them do it. That way you've not gotten engaged in that play at all. But if they are not showing any kind of signs of playing free kick or playing quickly, then you can go insert yourself. Once you've inserted yourself, there's no more quick free kick. Question here, does the ball need to clear the center circle before defense can contact the ball? The answer to that is no. Players have to be 10 yards away. Defensive players have to be 10 yards away from the ball at the time that a free kick is taken. Once it is played and clearly moves, then the defensive team can run in and touch it anywhere they want. Really quickly here, offenses and sanctions. I want to cover this briefly. It's a very, very short part of the law, but I want to make sure that we get it right. Again, if when a free kick is taken, an attacking team player is less than one meter from the wall formed by three or more defenders an indirect free kick is taken. It's important to note here, if when a free kick is taken, an opponent is closer to the ball than the required distance, the kick is retaken and less advantage can be applied. So if a player is a couple yards away and the attacking team puts it down and plays it off to the side and nobody really cares, we don't need to stop play for that. We can allow that to go. It's when an opponent deliberately prevents a free kick from being taken that we want to intervene and deal with it. And then lastly, a penalty kick is awarded if the offense incurs inside the kicker's penalty area, unless the kicker was the goalkeeper, in which case an indirect free kick is awarded if after the ball is in play, the kicker touches the ball again. A really rare thing that happens if a player kicks the ball and then touches it with their hand, we actually punish the more severe thing. So that's a, a little weird uh, thing in the law there. If a player kicks it and then touches it again, but this time with the hand, they're technically guilty of two different infractions. One is touching the ball a second time, which would be an indirect free kick. The second is handball, 
we punish the more severe of the two, which is the handball, which can also result in a penalty kick if it happens, though that's rare. Question here, defender persistently steps in front of the ball without backing up on every restart, caution or not. What I would suggest is the first time it happens, make a big deal about it. The first time someone, a defender runs up and gets in front of the ball so that they can't play it, stop everything, call the player to the side, and make it very, very clear to everybody involved that you're not going to allow that. If you don't deal with it the first time in a strong manner verbally, then you're going to have it happen more often. But if the first time it happens a game, if you blow the whistle, tweet, 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 come here, number 10, do not get in front of the ball when they're trying to play it. The next time it happens, it's going to be a yellow card. If you make that very, very clear the first time it happens in the game, more often than not, they won't do it. If it happens again, yep, give them a caution because that way you know it won't continue to happen and you've tried to warn them. Question here, do we caution a player for kicking the ball to an opponent and then asking the ref to caution his opponent for encroachment? The answer to that is no. We have to stop um, being so technical with our yellow cards. If someone is standing in front of where the ball was supposed to be um, and the player just kicks it into them really quickly without giving an opportunity for them to back up, tweet, tweet, blow the whistle, we don't have to give a yellow card. There's nothing in the law that says we're required to give a yellow card. It says you may give a yellow card. And so if a player is trying to back up and the player kicks it into them before they can get back, just stop everything, retake the free kick, and you know, talk to the player about getting out of the way. But don't go looking for reasons to give yellow cards. Question here, can you treat a warning for that like an entire team warning or only for that specific player? I noticed that many times the run up to block free kick is ingrained in the team rather than a specific player. Absolutely. That's why I said you want to do this in a public way. So if you have a player run to block the ball like that, stop everything, call that player over to the side and talk to them very publicly about moving away 10 yards and not blocking the ball. That becomes a warning to everybody on the field that they shouldn't do that or there's going to be a punishment for it and make it very, very clear that the next person who does it gets a yellow card. More often than not, that will tell everybody that you're actually going to deal with it. And then the next time it happens, sure, give a yellow card. Because if someone wants to complain, then you can say, hey, I warned number 10. I told you I wasn't going to allow it. They did it again. What do you want from me? That's very good proactive refereeing, but you have to make sure that that verbal discussion is very public. I don't mean raise your voice. I don't mean yell. but if you tweet, 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 hold on, please. Number 10, come over here. Please do not stand in front of the ball. Immediately give 10 yards or the next time it will be a yellow card. If you say it so the players can hear you and the coaches can hear you, now the next time it happens and you give a yellow card, you can go to the coach and say, coach, I warned number 10 very publicly and told everybody that wasn't going to be allowed. They did it again. Sorry, what do you want from me? You make it their fault, not yours. But again, with the technical things, the laying the restart, things like that, let's not go looking for it. If it's obvious, if a player tries to kick the ball and someone runs and jumps in front of them while they're kicking it, yeah, give them a yellow card. If they kick the ball away while they're trying to grab it and put it in play, yeah, give a yellow card because those are egregious. But if someone's just standing there and then they're on their way back or they're, you know, they haven't had a time to react really and, and somebody kicks the ball into them, don't give them a yellow card for that. Any other questions this evening? All right, then I thank you for joining. As always, I will put this on uh, the, the YouTube page here in a day or two, and you can come back and watch it if you would like. So again, as always, thank you and have a good night.